Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to another Krillionaire Crypto Chat, proudly brought to you by the Boston Coin from Boston Trading Co. And we have a very special guest with us today, um, Brian from Carver. Now, Brian, you look like a, a young fella who's probably been in crypto about three weeks. But uh, tell us a bit about your journey. How did you actually get started in cryptocurrency? Oh, it's uh, everybody finds their way into cryptocurrency in a, a bit different way. Um, I come from the, the gaming world and uh, I had previously started one of the largest esports teams in, in Europe called Fnatic. Uh, this is in the professional gaming space focused around live streaming uh, of you know, you know, worldwide competitions of, of different video games worked with a lot of the game publishers. And as, as people are well aware, uh, video games have digitally native currencies, whether it's World of Warcraft gold or rubies or whatever it might be. Uh, all that was, was very um, just intuitive coming from that space. So when I looked at crypto, uh, I just saw so many opportunities. And uh, the moment I kind of discovered it in, in early 2016 and, and 2017, I knew that I was gonna spend the next at least you know, five, 10 years of my life dedicated to, to building something in this space because it was just sort of a, a white board for whatever creative desires uh, you could have. There's so many different applications of blockchain technology, of, of cryptography. There's so many unlocking things that this new technology set can, can do. Um, so from that point, I set out to, to form a team uh, and up hiring a bunch of researchers, um, did a lot of research on the space early and decided that uh, interoperability and combining these new emerging uh, networks together was was the place we I wanted to play in. Uh, shortly after Kava Labs was was formed. Wow, but I mean that that's the thing with the early early days. You know, you could have some gold in World of Warcraft, but you couldn't jump across to say Pac Man and use that to buy costumes or Panda Pop or Candy Crush or something like that. So, for for you, I guess yeah, discovering I mean, the, crypto, the, the you can shop anywhere. The thing that the thing that got me excited was I could foresee this world of where world of warcraft gold could actually be used at starbucks and you could mm. buy a coffee and the user you know he just plays video games all day doesn't have a bank account sends you know the starbucks world of warcraft gold but using this technology the market is made between that world of warcraft gold and us dollars mm. um, and that transaction you can create payment rails now based on that um, and that's what i got really excited about i, I thought that there was just so much value that could be unlocked by allowing people to hold the assets they want to hold and not worry about anything else. Um, yeah. And I actually had this thesis that interoperable payments was going to be the thing that was really transformative. Turns out that wasn't true, or at least it isn't true yet. And the, the first products that we ended up building at Kava uh, were focused around this interoperable payment space, but crypto payments grew really, really slow through 2017 and 2018. Um, and you know, being just pragmatic and looking at what the market is telling us, uh, we had to pivot what Kava Labs is doing to what we're doing now, which is a decentralized financial platform for crypto assets. And, and what that means is rather than payments, it's focused on exposure. So holding different assets, giving them the opportunities to be lent uh, into lending pools where they can earn interest, uh, you know, different financial tools to put these new digital assets to work as capital to, you know, give people a way to have cash flow on their Bitcoin or have cash mm -hmm. flow on their XRP. Um, and um, do things like have collateralized loans using these assets, since you can't get that from a financial institution today. How, how I think about what we're doing now is we're basically creating a platform that provides all the services that retail banks do for, for ordinary users today. So whether it's collateralized loans, credit, uh, money market products, uh, high interest savings accounts, we're none of that really exists for cryptocurrency because they actually disintermediated the banks altogether. So we don't need you for custody. We, we're going to give the power back to the people. But then if you do that, you don't have the banks providing those services. They're not set up for that. There's all this regula regulation and compliance they have to do. Um, they've been out of the game completely. And that's where decentralized platforms like Kava come into play, where we can still interact with people with their cryptocurrencies and give them those same tools that they're used to having uh, that retail banks give them. But now we do it in a decentralized way where it's software that's delivering high interest products, money markets, and, and everything else. Um, and there's no counterparty on the other side. 
I think that was kind of the missing link with crypto, like getting in the early days and saying, okay, now I've got this coin that I can spend at Starbucks or, you know, like Laszlo famously buying pizza with Bitcoin. Um, but <clears throat> somebody, somebody once said that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies will never replace the financial system until we can actually borrow and lend. And this is what you guys have jumped onto there and said, okay, well, we can, we can actually borrow and lend. And I've seen some of the, some of the rates on your Carver site and I'm going like, this guy's going to pay me like a hundred percent for holding onto my own Bitcoin. Like, how is this real? How is this not a scam? Yeah. What's going on behind the scenes? Because the bank is paying I, I, us, you know, 0.01% interest in Europe, 236 banks are paying negative interest rates. So how can you actually pay me even, even 10% seems unrealistic. I, I feel deep in my heart that sometimes we need to artificially lower our rates because people will trust it more. <laughs> uh, because yeah, you're right. You give up 0.1% at, at a bank and um, you look at 10%, 20% on US dollars or you know, a stable coin, it, it seems unreal. Mm -hmm. But in reality, what you have in, in the real world is you deposit money into a bank and the bank takes that and lends it out to a borrower who is paying 20% APY, say, uh, to do a margin trade on, on some, you know, through some brokerage. Uh, they're paying a huge interest rate. The bank's capturing all of that and they pass you back a little pittance at the end. Um, yeah. And what blockchain and decentralized platforms like Kava can do is they can make all that autonomous, remove all the people who need salaries to do compliance and regulation. They can give access to anyone anywhere around the world to that, all while removing those middlemen, the banks and you know other people that, that insert themselves and pass all the proceeds from the borrowers directly back to the lenders who supplied that capital in the first place. Um, so it's really just efficiencies of capital at play and removing the people who are taxing the system in the first place. And it's, I don't blame the current financial institutions for being set up this way. It's that when you go through a centralized party, you're gonna have censorship, you're gonna have high fees, you're gonna just have that gatekeeper that's taxing everything that, that's going through it. It's just natural. I mean, they have salaries and mortgages to pay just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, but this blockchain technology that now exists uh, really disrupts all that. It makes this new paradigm possible where you don't need any of that. It's actually just more of like a peer-to-peer uh, network and marketplace where you have really good capital efficiencies. And it doesn't matter if you're a person who has $10 or $10 million, you're gonna get the same rates of return and the same treatment on these platforms because they, they don't care. They don't care who you are and where you come from. They just say, you know, be a good user, supply capital and you get a high interest. That, that really seems incredible, you know, particularly for someone like me, who's you know, maybe one or two years older than you and has grown up with the banking system. And you know, I, I remember when the banks introduced fees, like if you had $10 in your account, they would start charging you $5 a month just for keeping your money. Oh, I know. That's the worst. That happened to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and it was okay. Like if you had $100 million in the bank, then you were getting yeah. decent interest. But if you only had a little bit of money, then the bank was actually taking away your money. So looking at this like as, as far as cost base because i know like the traditional banking system they've got the atms they've got the big vans with the armed guards wandering around they've got a branch down in the main street they pay rent on and they pay the staff so what what's your estimate of the cost based reduction of having a decentralized banking system if you will i I only can compare it to, you know, you look at City or Goldman Sachs or whoever else that, you know, is a large participant. You're comparing legacy systems built in the 60s that are still being used to, to the modern day. Well, oh, the 1880s. And some of them. And, yeah, <laughs> right, right. It's about punch cards still. And you, know, you got a wagon transferring wires for Western Union. Uh, I, I think we're really talking about hundreds of thousands of people required to get the same job done compared mm -hmm. to what is just a few hundred people running nodes around the world to open up access to this new financial software. Uh, it is orders of magnitude uh, in, in terms of a reduction of cost base. So for someone who's trying to understand how come you can pay you know, 20%, whereas my bank pays 0.2, that might be a point is saying, you know, because you are sitting in an office there somewhere in the middle of, I don't know where, um, <laughs> rather than having a huge big bank and a banking system and all these all these people, whereabouts are you at the moment? 
Uh, I'm in California, actually, on a, a business trip right now. But I'm I'm based in Austin. I'm, yep. I'm one of the recent transplants that said, "And y'all in Texas sounds pretty good." <laughs> uh, and I I went <laughs> so over there. Sound Texas. So. <laughs> um, but uh, you're you're absolutely right. There's no you know brick and mortar. There's no retail to support. Uh, and and the best way to think about these decentralized networks is you have a bunch of large participants that run the nodes of the network. They front the cost, running effectively servers, AWS. Uh, you know sometimes it's bare metal rigs all around the world. You know, we have participants in China, South Korea, Russia, they're everywhere. Um, but those costs for each one are, are quite small and mm -hmm. they have a large stake in the network. They hold a lot of the governance token. They want to see it succeed. And in fact, these costs that are associated with running the network are socialized across all the participants and it makes it actually very small. Um, and I, you know, that, that's really just the power of decentralization here. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a few things because you've got Carver, which is your, I guess, underlying protocol. Then you've got hard. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if you can explain this. There's probably a few things in here. Like number one, if I've got Bitcoin, should I just deposit Bitcoin with you or should I cash in half of my Bitcoin and buy Carver coins? Is that going to be a better option? Because obviously you guys are going to clean up the market once people realize <laughs> the interest is real. It's not just a scam. I think it really comes down to a person person's technical expertise. Uh, we're doing all of our ability to remove the technical burdens to allow people to use our software and our platform. Today in crypto and DeFi, if you're not comfortable custing your own private keys, having you know a little hardware wallet that you store your Bitcoin on, um, you really can't participate in DeFi. There, there's just a lot there that um, you know people have troubles updating their settings on their iPad to connect their audio to Zoom, much less, you know, move hundreds of thousands of dollars of Bitcoin around. What, and, what's that? I couldn't hear you because the software. <laughs> 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 um, so where we really focus is, is to create direct integrations with the centralized venues. Even though we're a decentralized platform, we think it's Coinbase and Huobi and uh, Binance and, you know, in the future, PayPal and Fidelity and every other uh, you know, front facing application that's an investment platform for people to use. Uh, those companies can abstract all the difficulties away and people can keep their money on those platforms and all they have to do is press a button which says deposit Bitcoin into Kava and they start earning a return. And I think that's where the industry is headed. We're not there yet today. There's a lot of technical difficulties and burdens, uh, particularly around the UX. Um, but also people don't want to take on the risk of, you know, moving $100,000 of their own funds around uh, they're used to financial institutions doing that for them. And if they mess up, they can yell at the financial institution as the counterparty. Yeah. If it's a hardware ledger and they fat finger something, they are just going to yell at themselves and nobody wants to be in that situation. That's why 90% of people who hold crypto today don't do anything in DeFi, even though the yields are so high. Um, wow. It's going to change very drastically over the next few years. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're going to be at the forefront the whole way. Uh, leading in both yield and technology and hopefully user experience by integrating our products across exchanges. We've already done that with Binance. We've done that with BitMEX, which is rebranded to Ascendex. And we've done that with Huobi. Uh, and we have many more on the way. But, but that's really where things are, are headed. And you know, I'm, I'm very excited that we can just play a part in it all. I'm, I'm surprised it's 90%. It's I mean, DeFi you know, basically didn't exist two or three years ago. Um, yeah. but the people who are in crypto, obviously, yeah, they've been comfortable in the field and then they find out about DeFi and they go, oh my God, it, it's like in the olden days, you know, a thousand years ago, you'd be sitting at home with your little pile of gold and copper coins. <laughs> and, you know, then, then the Templar Knights come along and say, hey, we've invented this thing called banking, put your gold and copper coins with us. And when you come back next year, there's actually going to be more. It's like the greatest yeah. invention since sliced bread, which probably wasn't around in the 1100s either. But I, I would think that most people in crypto have heard of DeFi. I'm surprised that you know only 10% of people are using it. So I, I love the reference. <laughs> Going way back <laughs> in history, uh, I went to the uh, a museum of money in Shanghai where they showed these little coins that and their progression of being little coins. Before that, they were little knives. And before that, they were real knives that people traded. Mm -hmm. And it slowly has evolved into paper and then, you know, gold and then crypto and all sorts of other things. Um, so so I, I love all the history references. Um, but, but anyway, going, going back to uh, what, what you were trying to, uh, the, the point that you're making, 
I think the real challenge for people, again, is the risk. There's just so much risk in taking in control of your own finances in crypto that doesn't have a parallel in the traditional banking system. And until there's a way to remove that risk, people are going to be quite uncomfortable. It's not that they don't know DeFi is there. It's that mm -hmm. they're uncomfortable taking the actions required to take uh, advantage of the opportunity that, that DeFi presents. Some people just sort of, it's called aping in, but they just get that monkey brain and this, oh man, that's so good. I have to just take the risk and do it. Yeah. Um, but it's still, I would say about 90% of people are, are speculating on crypto. They, they move some money onto a, a trading app like, like Coinbase. They purchase some Bitcoin, maybe some you know, EOS or XRP or some other large cap, but they really don't know what these things are yet. There's mm. so many Robinhood traders that still think crypto or stock and you know they're, they're just, still learning and there's a whole new wave of people just like there was in 2017 in that bull run now coming into crypto for the first time and just experiencing it now um, and i think with the advent of tesla and paypal and other enterprises opening the doors um, to crypto to their audiences there's just going to be so more new so many more newbies coming in that are going to have to go through the same education hurdles that all of us went through years ago in, in, in the crypto space you, you, I, and I'm maybe, maybe I'm making this up, but I swear I saw something on your website that says you are paying like 100% interest. That Does might that be a composite rate. Right, uh, okay. Where, where in the early days of our, our applications, we actually provide both a native interest rate. So if you deposit Bitcoin, you earn Bitcoin as a return mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. borrowers. But then they're also uh, a reward incentive in the form of our platform's governance token. And that's given out to participants who both lend and borrow yeah. on, on the platform. So that is probably a composite rate. hundred percent is pretty high. Uh, so I would say that that's, that's probably 10 to 20% native interest plus mm -hmm. the, the rewards on top, making the effective APY quite high. Um, that's it's not going to last that way for long because yeah. the more people participate, tokens only go so far. Uh, but uh, I would say get it while it lasts. So in, in, I, I can, let, let's say, for example, I can put in one Bitcoin and I can earn 10 to 20% on that one Bitcoin in Bitcoin. So now I've got 1.2 by the end of the year, or I can earn the interest in Carver tokens. Is that um, the Carver tokens? So you, can, you, you get both. And actually, so I'll give you an example with the hard protocol, the money market um, for, for Bitcoin right now, there's a 20% APY sorry, 43% APY uh, on the Bitcoin lending pool because there's only about $6 million worth of Bitcoin in there right now. Um, so the pool is fairly small, it's fairly new, and there's a set amount of hard governance tokens that are distributed to the lenders and the borrowers of that pool. So the, the hard tokens in aggregate are worth quite a lot. So the effective APY that goes to users of that pool is, is, is quite high. Um, yeah, ho hopefully that makes sense. You, you don't have to choose native interest or the tokens. You actually get both. Uh, the, the tokens are just a bonus as a reward for being a participant of, of this new platform. Okay. And the, the tokens, are they limited in supply, like with Bitcoin and some of these other scarce coins? Yeah, so, so Kava uh, does have a small inflation rate, which gets paid to stakers who stake Kava. Uh, hard is limited. It has a set distribution schedule um, and it's limited to 200 million. Uh, hard token um, so that you know both, both are pretty limited in kind of their uh, increase in circulating supply over over time um, and, and yeah we've designed all of them in terms of token e economics to do quite well and I think uh, the demand has definitely outpaced supply uh, for both of them since we've launched yeah. now you, you said the um, the carver has some a uh, uh, inflation in there is that sort of built in is that locked in at a certain rate or does that fluctuate uh, so the inflation is based on how many people stake because it's required to create the security of the platform uh, it's a proof of stake network mm -hmm. meaning that we have to have a certain amount of tokens staked at all times to validate the transactions that are going on and, and make it a safe and secure place for big financial operations like lending and borrowing to, to happen um, what I would uh, maybe I'll, I'll clarify one point where Kava has an inflationary schedule that gets paid out to stakers. Um, so if you're not staking, you're actually losing, you're, you're leaving some money on the table in that regard. You're not capturing block rewards. But then Kava also has a secondary element where it's actually burned 
uh, as people lend or, or receive loans on the platform, they pay an interest rate and that interest gets converted to Kava tokens and then removed from the circulating supply. So there's a one dynamic which increases it, which is inflation, and then one that brings it down. And it's up to actually the governance group of Kava token holders to manage that much like a central bank would manage it with, with different interest rate levers and, and everything else. So at, at the moment, you know, you've got the, the Federal Reserve in the US who has just increased the M1 money supply by 30%. So there's literally like, you know, $3 around for every $10 that you used to have which yeah. people would naturally assume prices are going to go up by 30% because there's literally 30% more money washing around. Um, I have friends in the US who say that the price of gasoline at the pump has actually gone up by 14% in the last month, but the government's still saying, oh no, inflation's only 2%. So <laughs> do you believe well, the government, do you actually have yours like slightly higher, slightly lower? How do you manipulate yours? And is your system of controlling inflation better than what the government's doing, which is just lying about it? Well, the government lies by using, by pointing to things like CPI and, and other things, which are buckets of assets that may not get hit by new influxes of liquidity. Uh, if you look at asset prices globally, I think everything reflects that there's been a huge increase in, in, uh, in sort of the monetary supply. But what I believe in is actually that there's local inflation or hyperinflation for certain types of assets, and you might not see any inflation in others. And it, it really just depends on who's purchasing them. Like if you look at products from highly, that they're sold to highly affluent people, and you compare that to products being consumed by the average Joe, the levels of inflation are gonna be wildly different because how that inflation has reached each of these folks is completely different. People who have held assets through all this, uh, like stocks and everything else, are doing tremendously. Uh, they're they're able to you know, purchase new Teslas and everything else, and you know their spending habits have gone through the roof. Where the average Joe hasn't really seen much of that at all. So uh, it, it's all a local basis. Um, mm. In terms of Kava, it's much more straightforward. It's just financial products. It's just loans. We're just trying to keep the the assets and the liabilities in balance. Where for every loan that's been issued on the Kava platform there is an appropriate amount of collateral that's there at all times. And, and what the governance group is really trying to do is ensure that the, the platform itself is always solvent. Um, and programmatically and autonomously it should be, but you know, for whatever reason, if that doesn't happen, it means that the governance group has been making poor monetary decisions. And in that event, actually Kava is used to recapitalize the, the system and, and what, it, what more specifically Kava gets auctioned off to new people who can purchase it at a discount, it changes hands of the governance group and in turn it actually removes some assets off the market in exchange for Kava tokens and it puts the whole system back into balance so the debts are always over collateralized by, by the assets that are there. Um, and, and it's very different than the traditional banking system which is fractional reserves and, and uh, you know uses very very old methods of accounting that can be obfuscated. Everything's 100% transparent here on the platform that, that we're building. Um, so I don't imagine running into the same issues that, that we see from the, the traditional governments and um, monetary authorities that, that are out there now. But you, you've got to keep afloat for, for bringing in new people and things like that. So would you say, you know, like you inflate the supply by 5% and then you burn 2% and, and control it that way or? Um, so right now, all the burn tokens or the ones that should be burned are actually being put into a, it's like a SAFU fund, but it, it's a it's a bucket to cover any debts that end up being uh, unpayable for some reason. And we're building that up over time. That's going to be like an insurance fund. Most big trading companies that are centralized tend to have uh, like a rainy day fund that's about 10% of, of trading that, that occurs on those platforms that hasn't been seen in, in DeFi. Uh, we're taking the, a particular stance as, uh, as an ecosystem that we still think that rainy days can happen. We think that there can be technical malfunctions and other things, uh, even though there hasn't ever been. And in terms of Kava, we, we've never had a hacker and exploit. But in the event that, you know, there's always a chance that something mm -hmm. can happen. We wanna make sure that there's all, already assets there waiting to cover any losses and the system's always gonna be full. So right now, all the interest being paid is being collected into uh, an insurance fund. Once that reaches its target percentage, uh, then we'll start 
uh, with the, the burning again. So in the, in the long term, again, it's gonna be a balancing act that the governance group is gonna to have to choose. In the short term, we're just actually building up the robustness and the safety of the platform for all users. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess that makes a lot of sense. And particularly because, I mean, you know, banking is thousands of years old. And obviously, you know, normal banks set aside funds for what happens if a customer goes bankrupt, what happens if another bank next door goes bankrupt, what happens if, yeah. you know, we get broken into or hacked or whatever. Um, so you've got to have those insurance reserves and things like that to, to be safe and, and be seen for people. So yeah, and, and a, lot, a, lot, a lot of groups don't realize when they look at DeFi that while the programs may be audited and they function as intended, there's always this element of market risk. So mm -hmm. for example, if you have a bunch of collateral, uh, say Bitcoin, and price spikes down on Bitcoin and the collateral needs to be liquidated, uh, you're going to have a huge selling of Bitcoin at that event. And it's very different if you have 10 Bitcoin being sold off in that auction versus a thousand Bitcoin being sold off in that auction. It's going to impact liquidity and what's available uh, immensely. And if the liquidity isn't there, you're going to have a lot of price slippage and there's a lot that can happen from a market perspective uh, that could impact platforms like Kava, like all the other DeFi uh, things. But it's no different than what a traditional um, trading application would, would have to undergo uh, for any margin position, short position, anything with leverage. Uh, this is sort of the the normal every day for them. Um, and there's certain requirements that they have on their own treasuries and on their own balance sheets to, to make sure that in any event, you don't run into issues. And we're just doing the same thing um, that have made sort of the traditional financial system work for you know the, the past hundred years. We're just not doing it in this autonomous platform. Yeah. So obviously you've got people coming to you to borrow money. You've got people coming to you to, to lend you, I guess, just sort of deposit their, their crypto and things like that. Um, but how, how is the best way? I mean, is there some sort of, not, not, not a hack, but some sort of loophole in the system where I can deposit money and earn 20%, but I'm borrowing money and only paying 6% or something like that? Can you tell us the inside scoop? Ooh, so there's a lot <laughs> of different games and it, it really just depends on your risk tolerance. Uh, so for example, you can deposit Bitcoin uh, and take out a loan of our stablecoin USDX based on your Bitcoin deposits in the Kava lending app. You'll earn Kava tokens if you do that. But then you can take, instead of taking that loan and buying more Bitcoin with it or just holding it, you can actually take that USDX, stick it into the hard money market as a lender there, start earning hard tokens um, and interest in the hard money market from the borrowers there and the hard governance tokens are given off as rewards there. And you actually can compound both those uh, APYs together. And I think that's probably the most lucrative uh, opportunity. There's other things that people do, which, you know, but, but the, the thing I'll just point out, the big risk there is if BTC moves and your open loan position of USDX is high, you need to make sure that you're always over collateralized on that loan position. Otherwise you risk having that BTC liquidated. So there's a bit of risk. People have done fancy things like written bots to manage their positions as the markets move. Um, but then, okay, so, so then the other inside thing that people do is they rehypothecate stable coins. So they might lend BUSD, um, earn hard rewards, they'll, or, or they'll use BUSD as collateral to then borrow USDX, and then they'll supply USDX as a lender. Um, maybe they'll uh, actually do that same function uh, a few times nesting borrowing. So they could take BTC, borrow USDX, uh, you know, lend the USDX or use that USDX again as collateral to borrow more assets. And they might circularly do that quite a few times um, until they really maximize the rewards that they're earning on the platforms. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of different things that you can do. Uh, it's all about sort of what is your risk tolerance? How much of this like DeFi game do you, do you want to play? Um, I would say, you know, do things within reason. That, that's... <laughs> I, I, I'm not the full uh, DeFi degen. I, I like to just have nice, good, healthy, safe returns. Um, so I'm not doing any of that crazy stuff myself, uh, but I know lots of people are. Uh, I think just lending to the pool and earning interest is, is plenty for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's nice to know that we can still earn, you know, five or 10% like it's the, the late 1990s. But yeah. 
as you said, you're really flipping the scripts on, on the banking industry. And most people know a little bit about fractional reserve banking. Like I can deposit a thousand dollars into the bank, but the bank then can lend out, you know, $10,000 or whatever. And they yeah. can earn interest on $10,000, but I'm only still getting interest on my $1,000. That's nice to know that I can actually act like the bank and get in there and compound and leverage and borrow against this and, and kind of take advantage of the system if I wanted to, you know, and, and it's, it's to, me yeah. doing it. It's not the bank doing it. So. Exactly. Uh, and, and I think the outside of having the power back in your own hand, it's also just So with deposits at bank, even though banks don't go insolvent all the time, that it has happened in history. And you don't know where banks are lending your funds at the end of the day. You don't know how much in terms of reserve and collateral they're, they're holding. There's actually some banks that are super leveraged. They look very scary. And then if you look at the balance sheets of another bank, you're like, oh, that's really healthy. They, they actually don't you know, do any of that fractional reserving uh, lending at all. Mm -hmm. um, so... You know, I actually bank with some very small banks that, that don't go down that route and they're, they're actually quite safe. Um, but what I love about a platform like Kava is everything's transparent. You can see the balance sheet at all times. You can see what users are even doing, how much leverage they're getting out of the system um, yeah. because everything's transparent and open on blockchain. I can't identify who you are, but I, I can see your, your crypto, your blockchain account. I can see what assets are in there. I can see what... Uh, what you're doing in terms of the actions, how many loans you're taking out, what you're putting back into the system, all that's you know, visible for everyone. Um, so it's really an equal playing field in that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, tr the transparency is a huge thing within the, within the crypto industry and within DeFi, because we know yeah, that there have been banks, not just during the, during the GFC days, um, but even in the last two or three years who have been doing criminal things and, and eventually they get caught out and they pay you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in fines but nobody knows how many billions of dollars they actually got away with before they got caught. Yeah. So it's, it's nice to know that someone can actually track that. Uh, I mean, it's not you personally looking through all people's accounts, but there's a, yeah. there's a system in place um, where an algorithm is overlooking what's going on and making sure that people are doing the right thing. So it, it is, it is just really- an open ledger for anyone to see. Right. Yeah. There's no hiding. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I, I guess so looking, looking a bit broader out from, from Carver and looking from hard, um, looking at like there's, there's the DeFi industry, which is only sort of basically brand new. Um, what about the, the broader crypto industry as a whole? Like there's, there's almost 5,000 coins rolling around the market at the moment. Um, a lot of them are rubbish. A lot of them are scams. Um, there is some good projects coming out. What, what do you actually see happening in the next two or three years as crypto becomes more mainstream? I might be uh, a bit counter to, to what most people believe, but I, I think actually as these technologies and like where we focus on interoperability between the different platforms, uh, as that increases, the uh, ability to compete across different uh, crypto networks actually rises. And the competition for developers and the services you can offer, um, whether it's you know, privacy, DeFi loans, whether it's crypto kitties or NFTs, all those are effectively blockchain services that are offered by these different networks. When you can combine them all and you can stack them together in a single application because they've all been made interoperable, then developers are naturally just gonna choose what are the best services? And we have this today in web 2.0 with microservices, a developer can pick and choose what they want to use to, to construct their application. And I think that's really where web three is moving with new blockchain apps that as the interoperability increases, there's going to be a heightened competition across all the networks. And it's only the ones that specialize in doing one thing really well are going to stand out and survive the test of time. Um, at least from a developer perspective. And that's why we focused on DeFi and only DeFi. We don't try to be an open smart contracting platform. We don't try to, uh, you know, allow for a lot of testing and, and uh, in terms of like allowing developers to deploy any random code that they want. Um, it's only fully fledged, fully audited, robust code that gets deployed on the Kava network um, because we're conserving all the resources to do that one thing well, which is deliver the, the best in class DeFi applications. And where, where I think things go is 
the DeFi services themselves will get commoditized. Uh, the margins you can get from, you know, whether it's lending app A, B, or C, while they're amazing now, I think over time it's going to be, you know, squeezed from a, a competition standpoint. Um, and what that ultimately will mean is that the ones that have capital efficiencies and network effects built up, those are the ones that are going to stand for the long run. Whereas, uh, you know, I, we, the industry likes to say, there is no loyalty in yield. Uh, people will switch to the applications where they can find the best interest yeah. rate. And I think that's very true. Um, but what isn't, I think uh, what, what's often neglected is that it's the integrations. It's the uh, like relationships with the large enterprises that take a long time to, to happen, that takes you know, a huge effort for them to build that out and offer it to their users of you know, millions and millions of users. I think it's actually that network effect, building those integrations out and, and getting that wide distribution of DeFi platforms that's going to make or break a, a DeFi uh, platform like Kava over the next few years. Um, and that's why we spend a lot of our time making what we're doing, you know, a simple API that's easily extendable and integratable by any investment app, wallet, or, you know, crypto exchange. Um, because we think that that's really where the next battle for, for crypto is going to be. And mm -hmm. It's those groups that have all the users. Those users aren't going to get technical. You got to meet them where they want. And you know, they're seeking great APYs. And uh, I, I think that Kava has a chance to kind of lead the whole industry as it grows in that direction and from being very niche and technical to mainstream. I, I think, yeah, that's, that's probably a crucial thing because obviously we're looking societally, the, the, the demographic of the baby boomers, they're the ones who are retired and they've got most of the money, um, they used to be able to get 5%, you know, back in the, the 80s and 90s. And the, the, the fun bond <laughs> days, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and now they, they can't get that sort of return. But, you know, obviously hearing a return that is 10 or 20% is very, very attractive, but they think, oh, it's, it's high risk or it's complicated. I don't know how to program my iPhone, so I'm not going to be able to sort of program my cryptocurrency. <laughs> Um, is there a method for reaching out to the less sophisticated investors, the baby boomers, the traditional people who might be in their 60s or 70s? Ooh, I mean, I think that's really where, where the fidelities come into play with brands that they already know where they have relationships with people. We already know that a lot of the, the big financial institutions are educating their, uh, you know, their, their wealth advisors on Bitcoin and now referring it as a product. There's now... ETFs and things that are on normal trading platforms like the, the NASDAQ and, and NYSE that will be readily available for all the people in the venues that they know. Um, and I think that things like the De a DeFi index, uh, a composite of you know, a bunch of different e DeFi applications is a great next step. Uh, I believe Grayscale is already working on that. They've announced mm -hmm. one. Um, but then I think you're actually going to see financial products from the DeFi space get securitized in a way where they they're then extended to um mainstream investors that are older that you know want them in their td ameritrade or you know whatever accounts um and i think that what that looks like is just like you have products that are just based off of bond yields they just capture the yield and give it to people i think we're going to have products that securitize just grabbing DeFi yields and then providing that as a as a product to, to trade off of um, I mean, we you, you guys are building yet. up a big insurance. I, I think it's still. We are. we are. I'm thinking you could just go and buy Bank of America and put a blackboard out the front <laughs> saying we're paying 10% interest on your savings, Grandma. How about it? Like that, that could be a simple way to do it. Yeah, but then you still have to get them to take the action. And that's why I think the, uh, it, it's much better to work with Bank of America, allow them to help them create that product and then have them talk to the millions of people that they're already talking to and extend it to them in an in a easy and accessible way without having grandma need to learn, you know, what a long string of, you know, a, what a crypto private key and public key is, uh, mm -hmm. need to download new apps on her phone that she can't even call her own grandson on. Um, I, I think that's just too much of a stretch for where we're at. I mm -hmm. think we're, we, ha we have to meet people where they're at today. Focusing on education usually is not the right hurdle. Um, you want to make it seamless as an experience and hopefully integrate it into exactly what they're doing already. I was thinking when you were saying before about you know, industries consolidating and there's obviously a lot of DeFi platforms at the moment. 
and they, they used to be a lot of central banks, you know, 100 years ago, there used to be a lot of regional banks and state banks and things like that. And over time, they all got swallowed up. So yeah, can you give us the heads up and say, you know, which ones that Carver is actually going to buy and take over? Are you going to buy Bank of America? Because they're going to be losing money, man. They're going to be losing money. They're not paying much on deposits. And yeah, maybe some we, of the we other haven't, platforms are going we to haven't buy. seen. We haven't seen networks buy other networks in, in large amounts yet. I, I think that's very possible, mm. um, at, at least in the crypto space. Uh, there have been a lot of aqua hires and, and acquisitions, um, usually around exchanges needing to hire in technical people uh, to support networks like Kava that have a, a few you know, unique technical requirements. Um, I, I think that in terms of traditional finance, yeah, you, did, you definitely see correspondent banks shrinking up in their numbers and uh, kind of payments focused companies really struggling to, to do the volumes that they need to do to, to you know, thrive and grow and have investor interest uh, in, in the public forms. Um, I think that companies like Kava Labs, which just develops open decentralized software, we might acquire a company here and there that augments our capabilities and, and resources because we're trying to build new applications of the future. But the Kava network itself, I think is going to stand alone and continue to just do what it does well, which is provide financial services uh, to anyone anywhere in the world. And it doesn't need to acquire new things. It might fork code from a different project and pop it in to, to Kava. That's the beautiful thing of open source software. But I don't think we'll ever have the need to acquire a, a different network. Mm. I mean, I know like traditional finances, like banks will actually buy other banks and, and not change the name. They'll keep the same branding and insurance companies. Like yeah, there's one yeah. insurance company that might own 50 or 60 different insurance companies doesn't change the names. And one, one's insuring pensioners, one's insuring young people, one's insuring motorbikes, one's insuring houses. And there's, there's just one huge mega corporation that owns all of them. So, yeah, we're, yeah. we're just wondering if, if Carver's going to do that down the track. Should we just jump in and buy all of our, I, all I of think, our tokens now while before the, before the big price increase? I wish I could say go buy every, put every last cent into Carver. Um, but <laughs> I, I would say that's actually a horrible financial. That's going to be the quote. That's going to be the quote. <laughs> um, I, I think that the, the big route where Kava kind of eats the world is we have this focus on, on working with the institutions where users are today. And I, I do believe that that's gonna be a huge moat. It's gonna to lead to a lot of capital efficiencies that will, will just be light years ahead of the other applications out there. Um, and what that does is it allows our API that we're building out, which has API calls like borrow, lend, earn interest on all the different digital assets that are out there. Uh, if we own that relationship, we can preferentially route through that API to our services that we develop on the Kava platform. But if Kava is ever not competitive in that way, its API can still be competitive and it can route to, you know, some other new hot DeFi application that's providing better yields due to that particular event or the market dynamic that's going on in that particular set of time. And then when Kava and, and Kava's native apps become, you know, more robust and, and more adequate for the, the environment that goes on, or as the markets turn from one dynamic to another, then it'll just route back to the, the Kava native application. And I think it's actually that relationship and that integration that's going to be so valuable going forward, because then it's going to make the cost of switching for these uh, enterprises um, so much higher. And it, it just won't make sense for them to use anything else but Kava. Sounds great. So there's, there's a couple of things. I mean, I guess front facing, uh, there, there's two ways that you can benefit people. Obviously, they can get loans against their crypto to buy either goods and services in the real world or they can buy further crypto and people who want to hold on to their crypto can deposit it with you and earn rates that are phenomenally hundreds of percents higher than or oh, hundreds of times higher sorry hundreds of times higher yeah. than what they earn in the in the banks um, but then people can also profit from your systems by actually buying your coins and your tokens so where is the best way for people to find out more information? Where do they go to actually deposit? Where do they go to buy your token? So I can't tell you where to buy the token because it's different based on what jurisdiction you're in, but the leading crypto exchanges like Binance, uh, Huobi, Kraken um, are all hosts uh, and homes to Kava, to hard tokens, to everything else that uh, we'll be deploying on, on in the future. Uh, people can find us at kava.io. It's K-A-V-A.io. 
Uh, you can, there's links right on the homepage to all the different applications that are built on our platform, including the Kava Lending app and the hard money markets. Um, and from there, everything's just a few clicks away. Fantastic. And one final question. I know you're on, you're on a trip at the moment, so we appreciate your time. Why, why Kava? Kava to me is the drink that the people in Fiji drink and they get intoxicated. So is it an acronym? How did you come up with it with the name? It's uh, a very nice short domain that we had access to. Uh, so that, that's always a big win. Um, in terms of the name, it didn't actually have any meaning to, to anyone. And we actually like that a lot. Uh, we like the fact that uh, there wasn't anything in crypto associated with it. Very few people know about the drink that makes your mouth numb. Uh, they might know a little bit about the CAVA, which is the you know, Spanish wine region. Um, but KAVA didn't have any uh, associations and you know it was very easy to get naming rights and everything else and being a marketer by trade I like anything with a repetitive sound whether mm -hmm. it's coca-cola uh, which is you know a bit longer but just even uh, just anything repetitive tends to do well from a marketing perspective and kava was uh, you know short and sweet and, and that's all the things I like so perfect Perfect. Well, thank you again for your time. I appreciate that you're traveling around the world and, and doing your do at the moment. Um, so everybody want to jump on to Kava, K-A-V-A dot I-O, find out more about the project, jump onto your favorite exchange, look for the Kava tokens and the hard tokens. And of course, any other questions, yeah, feel, feel free to call Brian. I'll put, I'll put his mobile number in the link in the bottom. Oh, no. <laughs> Or they could obviously get, it, get in touch with us as well. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Brian. Yep. Thank you, Jeremy. Cheers.